Hello. In this video, we are going to demonstrate some of the principles of suturing bovine skin. We're going to talk about needles that we use for suturing bovine skin. We're going to talk a bit about the suture that we're going to use typically for suturing uh, skin in cattle. And we're going to talk a little bit about principles of, of how to drive the needle and, and tie our knots in the skin itself. Very commonly in suturing bovine skin, at least here at OSU, we use bronamid. One of the nice things about bronamid is it comes on a reel, so it's fairly inexpensive, and we can custom make whatever length of, of suture we want. So this is our S-curve needle, and this is a handheld needle, one of the, the important properties of this needle. And so the nice thing about this is we do not need a separate instrument, a separate needle driver to actually push this needle through the skin. It will be done completely using our hands. It does have an S shape, hence the name s curve needle. One of the other very important properties, in fact, this is essential for passage through bovine skin, thick bovine skin, is that it's a cutting needle. Taper needles are not going to penetrate the, the skin of an adult cow. It's too thick, and if you try to do it with a conventional taper needle, it is going to tend to bend your needle or break your needle off. The other nice thing about this needle, when we talk about, and one of the things that makes it very advantageous for getting through bovine skin, is that it is a very stout needle. Although not impossible, it is very unlikely to bend or break as we're putting the force behind it needed to, to go through the thick collagenous skin of, of cattle. And lastly, it is an eyed needle. It's got an eye at the end of it. And so it's not a swedged on needle, but this gives us versatility in that we can take whatever suture we want. In this case, I'm using number three bronamid, and I can pass that through the eye of the needle. I don't need to use bronamid, but this is a very common needle type, or excuse me, suture type that we will use for suturing the skin in, in cattle. Some people like to take this suture and actually pass it back through the eye a second time. And what this does is this effectively locks that needle into place or locks the, the suture into place within that needle. And it decreases the likelihood that that suture is going to slip out of the needle. However, what it also does, and this is a, a negative to doing that, is it increases the amount of suture that's wound around the end of that needle, and so it increases the bulk, and therefore it increases the resistance to passage of that needle once that needle reaches, passes all the way through the skin, and it, that last part of the needle still has to go through the skin, there is a little bit more resistance to, to passage, and you'll feel that kind of stick. And usually with just a little bit of manipulation, just some gentle rotation and wiggling of that needle, typically that will pass through the skin. So now, we are going to suture this mock incision that we have in this, uh, in this cow hide here. One of the first things, while I'm still focused on the needle, is how we hold it in our hand. The point of the needle is obviously at the, the distal end that's going to be used to advance the needle through the skin. The eye is at the opposite end. And that curve, that first curve back towards the eye of the needle, is the part of the needle that's going to actually fit in your hand. And I like to put it right there, centered right over my knuckles on the, on the palmar side of my hand. And then you can wrap those fingers around it. And with my thumb, I am bracing the very end of the needle with probably about a centimeter of needle at the tip that's exposed. And this gives me a very secure hold. And it also gives me some control right at the very tip that I can direct where I want that tip to go. One of the things that is a mindset shift compared to what you guys are used to when we teach you how to do suturing on dogs and cats or incisions that are oriented this way is that our incisions frequently in large animal, especially when we're doing standing surgery in the flank, are oriented more towards and away from us versus from right 
to left on the table. And this is going to be a little bit of a challenge when you're used to doing your suture patterns in an opposite direction and especially when you're used to doing your hand ties with references of away from you and towards you. Now you've got to think of um, from the one side of your incision being the left side of your incision and the other side being your right side of the incision. And so it's really everything, the principles are exactly the same, it's just everything is twisted 90 degrees. So now we're going to take our suture and we're going to attempt to suture up this incision that we have. The first thing that, that I want to do is I'm going to actually start my incision just a little bit more dorsal, if you will, to where this incision starts. And so this will be dorsal away from me and ventral will be more towards me. If this was a standing animal, you can imagine that the incision would actually be oriented in a vertical direction, and this would be dorsal, and this would be ventral. So I am going to actually start my incisional closure over where the skin is already closed. This skin is really thick, and you can appreciate that when you, when you get a chance to, to see the skin and feel it in lab, but this skin is very thick. If you try to pass the needle, through uh, in, in any direction other than perpendicular through the skin, you're actually going to be undermining and dissecting through the dermis. If you try to dissect that needle or pass that needle through the skin in any direction other than perpendicular through that skin, that is going to make passage of that needle really challenging. So when I start my incisional closure, I'm actually going to begin my incisional closure about a centimeter dorsal to where that incision begins. And what that's going to allow me to do is when I tie that first knot, I can actually tie that knot without having that knot actually having to bring those edges of the incision together. And that's going to allow me to tie a tighter knot. And so I'll begin about a centimeter dorsal to the incision. I'm actually going to evert the skin edge, which is going to allow me to pass that needle more of a perpendicular manner through the skin. And then I'm through one side, and when I feel it, the tip of the needle underneath the skin on the other side, I evert that skin in such a way that I can pass in a perpendicular manner through, and I advance the needle through the other side. Now, when you go to advance the S-curve needle, it makes it a lot easier if you allow that needle to kind of twist as it goes through the skin. And if you try to pass it straight because of the shape of the needle, there will be a good bit more resistance to needle passage. And so now you can pull the bulk of the suture up. And now, since we don't have an instrument in our hands, since we don't have needle holders, this is a great time to do a hand tie. And you can do a one-handed tie, you can do a two-handed tie. Personally, I prefer one-handed ties. And we've got, we want to tie four throws, and now we've got a knot tied just dorsal to where our incision begins. So now we will continue with our incisional closure. And really any appositional suture pattern is appropriate for skin closure in cattle. We oftentimes will do forward interlocking closures and an advantage of forward interlocking is it tends to, it's a continuous pattern, so there's only one knot at the beginning and one knot at the end of the suture line, which speeds up the closure. And with, it, inter, with each interlock, it actually adds a little bit of resistance, a little bit of friction, which actually decreases the likelihood that that incision line is going to, to come undone. And so what I'm going to do next I'm going to come down about an equal spacing as what I took for my initial bite. I'm going to come down the incision about a centimeter. On one side of the incision, I'm going to go through. And then on the other side of the incision, if we do a forward interlocking, I'm just going to pull that suture right around that tip of the needle. And then I'm going to drive that needle through the other side of the skin. And that is my second bite.
Again, equidistant down, about a centimeter down. I'm taking about a centimeter bite across, drive it through one side in a perpendicular manner, and then I evert the skin so I can drive through perpendicularly. I'm gonna pass that suture around the other side and let the needle kind of twist just a little bit as it comes down, and that's my next bite. And so we can keep doing this. So as I continue suturing, I'm just continuing my forward interlocking pattern, and as I advance the needle, just make sure that needle kind of twists. It'll help you get it through the skin. You've probably noticed that when I complete a bite and I go to tighten my bite down, sometimes the skin edge everts a little bit. Usually that's correctable. Um, even to the end of the, of the surgical closure, you can tighten it up and then you can actually push those everted edges down and that will usually result in a pretty nice appositional closure. So now that we've taken five bites, we are actually now going to demonstrate how to close the forward interlocking or how to finish the forward interlocking pattern. If you've locked the suture into your needle by passing it through twice, it's actually very important at this stage that you've unlocked it. It is important to unlock it now that that suture can pass freely in and out of the eye of the needle. Obviously, if I was suturing this up in real life, I would have continued to the, basically to the end of the, the incision. However, typically with suturing DAs in C-sections, very large flank closures in cattle, we usually will leave about an inch unsutured at the bottom that we actually close with some type of interrupted suture, either a cruciate or a couple simple interrupteds. And what this allows us to be able to do is if that incision would develop a seroma, a hematoma, or most importantly, if it would develop an abscess, we could actually open those last two bites and open that incision, provide drainage without having to take that entire continuous line out. I would, if this was a real life scenario, I would have continued it down again to probably about this far. I wouldn't stop halfway. But for purposes of this demonstration, we've now got five bites in and we are gonna finish in our forward interlocking um, closure. So we've unlocked the suture from the needle and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna pass the needle backwards through the skin. And so I'm gonna take a bite about equidistant that I have been taking bites. So I've been taking centimeter bites as I've moved my way down the, the incision from a dorsal to ventral direction. And I'm gonna pass it backwards through the skin. So through the left side and through the right side. A very important step is that you don't pull this end of the suture through when you pull the needle through. So I'm gonna hold on to the end of the suture and as I pull this needle through, I'm gonna cinch down on the loop. So this loop right here cinches down, but this end stays on my original side. I make sure all of these sutures are tight, all the bites are tight, and you can try to pull some slack out if it looks like that skin is, is gaping. And I pull the suture that is actually connected to this, the vertical interlock side. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tie back to this end that we've held onto on the opposite side of the, the incision. And again, this is a prime time to do a hand tie. If you don't want to do a hand tie, certainly you can do an instrument tie. It's just as effective, 
but the nice thing about a hand tie is that you don't have to put your needle down, reach for another instrument. And that concludes the forward interlocking pattern to suture up the bovine skin. So just as a recap, everyone, we talked about the S-curve needle. The nice thing about the S-curve needle, also marketed as a post-mortem needle, because it's used for suturing up post-mortems uh, in, the, in the field, but it's a handheld needle. So the nice thing about this is we can hold it in our hand. We don't have to have an extra instrument, a needle holder, a needle driver, that makes it really convenient when we're doing these types of surgeries in the field. It's a very stout needle. It's a cutting needle, which is necessary for getting through thick bovine skin. And it's got an eye, which gives it versatility for passage of whatever type of suture you want to use with it. When we pass the needle through the skin, we want to make sure we drive that needle in a perpendicular direction. If you try to drive it with the skin, like you might be putting a catheter or something like that in, it's going to be dissecting through this thick collagenous tissue and it's going to be really difficult. But if you can pull this tissue, if you can pull the tissue sort of everted a little bit so you can facilitate driving it through in a perpendicular manner, that's going to make passage of this needle a lot easier through both sides of the skin. When you advance the needle, make sure that the needle advances as, or make sure the needle curves as it advances. When it hits that eye, especially if you've locked that suture into place, it will kind of increase, it'll have a little bit of resistance and it'll feel it catch a little bit, but with a little bit of manipulation, you'll be able to get it through. Again, since we don't have needle drivers in our hands, hand ties are really, really useful for suturing up bovine skin when we're using a, a, a handheld needle. The other thing that I will mention is that in cattle, we pull the sutures down tight in the skin. And I know this is different than what you're taught in small animal principles of small animal skin closure where you want a little bit of looseness. One of the big differences is that bovine skin, even though it starts out thick, it swells very minimally. And so we don't have to account for tissue swelling. The other thing is the environment that these animals are going back to is not a clean house type environment. They're going back into a barn that's dirty, that's contaminated, and we want to make sure that we achieve a good seal with our closure uh, of the skin. And so, therefore, we're going to pull these down, pull these down nice and tight. Uh, the suture that we use today is Bronimid suture. There's nothing magical about Bronimid. Some nice things about Bronimid suture is it comes on a reel, so we can pull out as much as we want, as little as we want. We, it is a non-absorbable suture, so these will need to, to come out. It is a braided suture, which actually increases the uh, friendliness, it decreases the memory, and it actually makes it a lot nicer to work with. One of the disadvantages of braided suture is the increased capillarity, and sometimes they will wick fluids. However, bronamid is coated, and so that actually decreases the likelihood that that's going to wick um, fluids from, from the inside out or, or outside in. Um, and that really concludes the main points what I wanted to talk to you today about. Thank you very much.